want to get started with our webinar series from the headquarters of the Corps of Engineers. Um, today our topic is uh, Army Low Impact Development Program uh, Overview, Planning and Tools. Uh, our primary speaker is an ecologist, uh, Sharon Starter, along with civil engineer Aaron Cox, and AXIM program proponent, Bill Sproul. Uh, partnering with the Corps of Engineers, the Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management uh, Construction Division is leading the Army's initiative for integration of low impact development, LID, to meet the requirements of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. This webinar will introduce federal and DOD LID policy, the Army LID initiatives, and future Army LID guidance and the LID planning tools. Sharon Starter is an ecologist with the Corps of Engineers, as I mentioned, uh, up in Baltimore District. Uh, she works with the Planning and Environmental Services Branch and provides water resource management and natural resources support to military installations within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Sharon is the program manager for the uh, Chief AXIM's um, effort to integrate low impact development within Army construction and also the co-chair of the USACE Regional Center of Expertise for Hydrology and Low Impact de Development. Some of you may remember her as your instructor at the Army Low Impact Development Training Course, which was sponsored by OXM. Uh, she holds a master's degree in environmental management from Duke University. Joining us for the Q&A session a portion is also Bill Sprawl from AXM. Uh, Bill is the Army's program manager for overseas contingency operations with the Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff of Installation Management. While he provides day-to-day -day oversight to the Afghanistan construction program, Bill is a member of the Army Facilities Design Group, where he has supported several sustainable design issues, including the development of stand Army standards and has championed implementation of LID throughout the, through the Army construction program. Uh, with that, I will uh, flip this over to... Uh, Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me? Uh, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon to go over the Army Low Impact Development Program. Um, like, I, like Eric had mentioned, this work is done with uh, OAXM, with Bill Sproul. He is our project proponent and the lead for integrating low impact development in Army construction. Just an uh, overview of what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to go over low impact development, LID, as we have it uh, in the acronym there. We're going to go over the LID policy and guidance. Then we're going to discuss the Army LID initiative that's been led by AXM, including the SDD policy update that I hope you've all seen from December, the Army technical user guide, the Army LID planning and cost tools, integrating LID in planning, and also reporting requirements. Uh, at towards the end of the webinar, we'll go over an example in the Army LID planning tool. So hopefully many of you are familiar with low impact development, but if not, our, uh, the definition of LID is to retain pre-development hydrology and natural design approaches as a mechanism for pollutant removal and improvement in stormwater quality and quantity. So we're using low impact development to manage stormwater as opposed to our conventional systems that are you know, storm pipes and ponds and what have you. So uh, the primary goal of low impact development, like I said, is to mimic a site's pre-development hydrology. And you can do this through infiltration practices, filtration, storage, evaporation, detention, and harvesting. Some of those practices can be non-structural such as riparian buffer protection or restoration, uh, site fingerprinting, so when you have your site and you're uh, going to construction, you would flag out sensitive areas, watch for certain slopes that might be highly erosive and soils, watch out for rare threatened endangered species, um, to flag those off and avoid, avoid any impacts from construction to those areas. You can also preserve natural flow paths and use them in your design. 
as you're planning for stormwater management features. There's also structural features that many of you are probably more familiar with, such as bioretention, permeable pavement, green roofs, rainwater harvesting, to name a few. So let's get into why are we using lid? We have a, the federal requirement, which is Section 438 of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Hopefully many of you are familiar with that. That then drove the Department of Defense memo, uh, DOD implementation of stormwater requirements under Section 438 of ESA. Uh, which has then been incorporated into the UFC for low impact development. And from there, the Army's policy, uh, the Sustainable Design and Development Policy Update, that was recently updated in December, so it's not so recent anymore, uh, and that calls out the use of low impact development to comply with ESA Section 438. So I'll go into a little detail on each of those. So this is what ESA Section 438 says exactly. Stormwater runoff requirements for federal development projects. The sponsor of any development or redevelopment project involving a federal facility with a footprint that exceeds 5,000 square feet shall use site planning, design, construction, and maintenance strategies for the property to maintain or restore to the maximum extent technically feasible the pre-development hydrology of the property with regard to the temperature, rate, volume, and duration of flow. So there's a lot that goes into that paragraph there, and we'll cover how you comply with that as we go through these slides. From the EPA technical guidance, an executive order, EO 13514, Federal Leadership in Environmental, Energy, and Economic Performance, required federal agencies to lead by example. And from this, the EPA was required to develop the technical guidance on implementing the stormwater runoff requirements for federal projects under Section 438 of ESA. Hopefully many of you are familiar with this document. In this document, it goes through two options for design objectives to comply with ESA that include option one, which is retaining the 95th percentile storm, and option two is doing a site-specific hydrologic analysis to determine what you need to maintain and manage on site. So from, our, from there, we go to the OSD policy that, again, requires you to manage uh, stormwater on site for a footprint greater than 5,000 square feet. And here we have a definition of pre-development hydrology, which is the pre-project hydrologic conditions. This is not going back to was in good condition. It's going to what was there before your project. The, um, sorry, the project site design options should be evaluated to achieve the, the design ex objective to the maximum extent technically feasible. And we'll go over later um, what technical feasibilities might be. And for also include redevelopment projects. So you should also consider what the site was before for redeveloping. And that is the pre-project conditions there. So it's redevelopment. You, you know, you might be able to pull out impervious surface and put it back to meadow. So. Uh, so this OSD policy has been incorporated into the UFC. And in both the, this policy and the UFC, there is a re or documentation requirement to document the project cost, uh, which uh, just wanted to highlight that because we'll be talking about reporting a little bit later. So this is UFC. 3-210-10, low impact development. This gives you criteria and design standards for DOD construction in the U.S. It, the documentation will help you comply with ESA Section 438 and the DOD and Army policies. It better describes what low impact development is, the philosophy behind it. It also highlights that the DOD has chosen to use option one listed in the EPA technical guide, and that is using the 95th percentile design storm event for determining the lid design volume. This method is a little bit simpler than doing the hydrologic analysis, and we have, we'll present a planning tool later in the webinar that will help you use the 95th percentile storm to determine the quantity of water you need to manage on site. Also highlighted is that you should uh, consider your state and local requirements for stormwater management, and that those need to be met in addition to meeting ESA Section 438. 
uh, this slide has a lot in it, but a lot of it's just the, the highlights pulled right from the SDD policy update. I want to note that the policy applies to all construction activities on Army installations regardless of funding. Um, also that Army funded construction activities on or regardless of location. So if they're on a joint installation though, that the supported component would guide the construction policy and guidance. Um, and also the same for our overseas. The effective date. We should all be incorporating low impact development into project designs now. Uh, SRM projects, they were required to start in FY14 and full compliance in FY15. So we should start seeing low impact development in all the 1391s that are being prepared and hopefully ones that have already been prepared. So the stormwater management paragraph in the policy update is very close to what ESA section 438 says, but I'd also like to highlight here about the documentation requirements. Documentation of the project compliance with ESA 438 will be maintained in the project file and will be reported via chain of the command for annual SSPP reporting. And that is the Strategic Sustainability Plan. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. In the policy, there is a link to the uh, USAFE webpage where you can find a lot of guidance documents and the technical user guide to help assist you through complying with ESA. Okay, so we've gone through all of the requirements, and here we're, this slide explains what the Axum LID initiative has entailed so far. The first bullet is the Army LID implementing guidance. This is guidance that is currently in draft. It's being um, it's being forwarded to Army commands for review and concurrence with comments very shortly. So watch out for that if you're interested in reviewing the guidance uh, and providing comments. Once the comments are received, they will be incorporated and turned around quickly for signature by Major General Aycock. So that will help you understand what it is specifically that the Army is required to do for using LID to comply with ESA Section 438. In addition, we have the Army Low Impact Development Technical User Guide. Some of you might have seen this before, uh, especially if you have been to the previous LID training. Uh, that is also on the website that was cited in the SDD policy and the websites below. The User Guide is a tool to help folks on Army installations as well as Corps of Engineers planners to go through the process of integrating LID into construction projects. We also have the Army LID planning tool, and th there'll be a demonstration of that tool at the end of this webinar. That will help you determine uh, what the quantity of water is that you need to manage on site for the 95th percentile storm. And once you get that quantity of water, you'll be able to then size, uh, estimate sizes for different BMPs to ensure that you are managing that quantity of water to comply with ESA Section 438. There's also an Army LID cost planning tool that is a draft right now and it's being reviewed through the Corps. If you're interested, please let us know. It allows you to put in the rough dimensions that you have from the LID planning tool where you sized your BMP and you can plug that in and, and it will help you calculate a rough estimate of cost. And this is to be used during uh, the planning charrettes and 1391 development. And we have the two Army LID website links there. And so, um, oh, just a, a brief overview of the LID technical user guide. So the first chapter will go into background, governing policies and regulations that will help the user understand why are we doing this, what is driving the use of low impact development for stormwater management. Chapter two is a toolbox of LID BMPs, so they're best management practices that can be applied to construction projects. So that covers non-structural BMPs that I mentioned before, things like riparian buffer preservation, site fingerprinting, sensitive area conservation, and also the structural BMPs, the bioretention, infiltration practices, permeable pavement. It'll give you a, a brief description of each with examples of applications in different types of land use areas or activity areas, whether it's training or a containment area, where those work best. 
um, and it'll also give you just some um, rough design specs. Chapter 3 includes the description of the planning process to integrate low impact development into construction. So it'll go through uh, site planning for your specific project and also recommend things for master planning so that you have a more holistic approach to stormwater management on the installation. Chapter 4 is where we get into the hydrologic modeling and the, the simulation tool that's the lid planning tool where it'll describe how you use that planning tool to determine the required amount of volume of water to be managed on site and it'll go through the tool so you get that number and how to plug it in on the next part of the planning tool to figure the size of your BMP that you might select. Chapter 5 ha highlights design, construction, and maintenance objectives for the common structural lid BMPs that covers the bioretention, the permeable pavements, and green roofs. Those are the ones that are the most commonly used and it'll give you some more idea of, okay, now we've got it designed. What do you have to watch out for while constructing and to plan for the future for maintaining each of these BMPs. Um, and there's also a glossary in there in the back for new users that aren't quite familiar with terms and some examples of applications like green streets and everything. So overall, it's a very comprehensive guide and we definitely recommend you taking a look at it and using it to help you through the planning process, modeling and everything and um, better understanding the Army's Low Impact Development Initiative. All right, so the, the websites here, this is a public website. This is, this is a hydrology and lid center of expertise site on the headquarters core sustainability webpage. So on this site, it describes pretty much what I've been talking about. And there is a link to the technical user guide uh, right in the text of the third paragraph. So yes, yeah, and the lid guidance, and it's also right in the paragraph. Uh, there's the policy, so you can click on each policy. Uh, you can click on ESA's there. It's the whole entire document, so you just have to scroll through to get to section 438. We have the SCD policy update, and then the next box has the lid guidance. We have a tech user guide, uh, supporting information about ESA section 438, the EPA tech guide, and some more. Uh, reference material there. So this is a public website you can get on. And I'll just give you a little brief uh, summary about the Sustainability Center of Expertise for Hydrology and LID. Let's go to the next slide. So this is one of the many Center of Expertise that are um, part of the Headquarters Initiative. And we, have a, we also have a Mercy page. This requires a login, so hopefully some of you already have a login. But you just need to put your email, make up a password, and you can get right in. Um, and it has a, this is this is a work in progress. So when you get there and you see some of the tabs aren't filled out yet, it's uh, still relatively new. So we have here where we circled. You can also get to the same documents that are on the headquarters public page, but on the login page, you can also get the planning tool that we'll discuss later that'll help you determine the volume of water to manage and uh, do an estimate of a size for a BMP and also the draft cost planning tool is in there so you can go in there and try to play with that and get an estimated cost that you can use for using the 1391 planning charrette. The, that is also a draft tool and updates will be made to it when we have some feedback. So if you do have feedback there is an email address on there. We have Patricia Donahue who's on there. You can email her or Erin and my email will be at the end of the presentation. All right, so those are all of the tools and the policy. So let's talk about integrating low impact development during the planning process. So first we'd like to start big picture to make sure that low impact development, the philosophy of it starts becoming our norm as opposed to the conventional heights and ponds. It's a great idea to try to integrate low impact development into your master plan. Where it's possible, you can start seeing synergies between your little parcels of land and your project so that you can have maybe some treatment trains, if possible, going across sites where you may have some different BMPs that flow into each other for maximum water retention or even water quality benefits. So by planning it early, then you know that 
you will be able to, to have a more holistic stormwater system. And, um, the next slide. and also updating your installation design guide with the impact development, you'll know that when, the, when you're doing stormwater management on site and that's being planned and designed, that there may be a selection of BMPs that are low impact development that the contractor can use and it can include you know what what BMPs are preferred in different land use areas on an installation or what plants are preferred to be planted and also we'd like to note that a new initiative is underway help installations with updating the IDG to include low impact development so a supplement is going to be prepared to as kind of a guidance and it will be sent out um, in the near future, so watch out for that. Here's an example of what could be included in the design guide. This is from Fort Hood, where you have your different uh, activities on your installation. So let's say it's a family housing area, troop housing, or a recreation area, a rangeland. And across the top, you have integrated management practices, which are the same as best management practices. And you have your list of low impact development BMPs and a checkbox where it would be most appropriate to use those types of BMPs. So this is something that you know could could be included in the IDG. Okay, so we have the, the big picture installation planning and now we're going to talk more about uh, project planning. So like we said before, LID should be incorporated in FY15 MILCON and FY14 SRM. So basically we should be doing, we should be doing this now and the best way to get or make sure that low impact development is incorporated and the project's in compliance with ESA Section 438 is to include it on the DD 1391. So while you're developing in the planning charrette and filling out the 1391, first it's best to identify the limit of disturbance for the project and are you over 5,000 square feet? If so, then you are going to need to incorporate low impact development and make sure that you understand what the volume requirement is to manage the difference between the pre-project and post-project. And there you, you have the master planner from the installation and your engineer designer start working on that lid strategy. It would be great for the master planner to come in with an idea already that he might have worked on from the updating the installation master plan. So here you start working on what BMPs would work on the site. You can use the planning tool during the planning charrette, figure out what the volume you need to manage, what size BMP does that work with, and also start using the cost tool. So you should have a, a pretty good idea of what to get into the 1391, and the items should be, the lid BMP should be itemized so that we can, it's ensured that it is included as the project goes forward. So as it goes forward, when you do the project definition report and the 3086, you can further refine what BMPs are going to be used, maybe the sizing, and also the, the cost. So again, we're making sure that the BMPs are included and they get funded and you are doing what you need to do to comply with ESA. You'll go through the design charrette and you know, further work on the details of the BMPs and then the project's all said and done, you will, uh, the installations will be required to report on meeting ESA and what BMPs were selected. So we'll go to the next slide. So for the programming, the 1391 programming document, uh, Bill Sprout Axum is working right now to have a worksheet on tab J, the storm, drain, the storm drainage section, to have a place where you start inputting the details of low impact development BMPs that were selected for compliance with ESA section 438. So for right now, we're going to use tab C and it will be a narrative that is included in tab C where you include the estimated limit of disturbance. So that's where we know are you 5,000 square feet or above that, then you have to comply with ESA. Include the planned lid BMPs with descriptions brief a summary. We'll have an example in a minute. And then, of course, as you go through the PDR 3086 phase, you can refine the BMPs and the cost estimate. And also for the 1391, since we do recommend that you use the planning tool and the cost tool, there are worksheets that you can print out and attach. So next. So
So while we're waiting for tab J to be updated, please use tab C. So here's an example of tab A where we have the low impact development features itemized. So you can see uh, the arrow is pointing at uh, rain garden. We have the estimated um, cost and size, uh, infiltration gallery, rainwater harvesting. So that's what we would like to start seeing so that we can ensure A, that lid is included and B, this will be helpful for reporting. So like we said before, while tab J is being updated, we're going to use tab C. And here's an example of the type of language that uh, could be included in tab C. So first we have project location, where the project is planned for, um, and then the project limit of disturbance, this is where we know is it above 5,000 square feet or not, and um, this is a general idea of how much impervious surface there's going to be to the net submit, and number three would be your runoff quantity. You can use a planning tool to uh, calculate what your pre- and post-development runoff would be, and right here you put what you require to manage. You get that from the planning tool from the first page. And then, in the end, you'll put the selected lid BMPs, and it'd be great to just itemize them again like they're seen on tab A. And we have, say, um, you know, non-structural BMPs can be included, like maintaining some forest area, or um, specifically constructing bioretention BMPs, and just description of a general where they're going to go. And, um, so they're all itemized and with a brief description. So this is um, minimal information at the planning charrette phase, and it can be updated as you go through. Um, next slide. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to Erin Cox. She's a civil engineer here at Baltimore District. And she will start with reporting and then go through the uh, planning tool. Thanks, Sharon. With reporting for ESA Section 438, I think it's been um, a question mark for the past few years. AXM hasn't been receiving um, any reporting. And the new SDD policy memo in uh, December of 2013 actually highlighted that and said that it's required as part of the Strategic Sustainability Performance Plan, sub goal 2.3. Um, AXM is required to report the percentage of projects that meet ESA Section 438 up to OSD through the chain of command. Um, this is a requirement for the installations to report up the chain, uh, basically yes or no, did you meet ESA? But it's not necessarily that simple because since ESA is kind of a, the actual legislative language is a paragraph that just says maintain pre-development hydrology, we kind of have to, when you get down to the design, level, you have to quantify it and say, what do what did we do to actually meet ESA and how can we prove it? So as part of uh, Bill Sproul's AXM implementing guidance that's going to go out for uh, Army Command review in the next few months, there's a draft ESA reporting form in there that basically has all the data fields that um, a designer of record would fill out and then anybody could look at that form and figure out if the project did comply with ESA or not. And it would be kept with the project documentation. So if somebody had to go back to it in a few years, it would all be there. And it's kind of a way to consolidate all the information in one place. Um, and in addition to just the reporting aspect, when projects are getting reviewed, either peer reviewed by the core or um, the customer, the installation DPW is reviewing, they're, they'll be able to see, yes, this project met ESA without having to kind of root through the calculations and pull out the correct numbers. So this is just a screenshot of the reporting form. But um, the first page is basically your project information. And then the second page is where it gets into the calculations. And we're going to see these calculations in the lid planning tool in a minute. But um, the only person that would really know this information is a designer of record. So it's important for the installations to make sure they're collecting this from um, the designer, whether it's the core with the designer or an AE firm or um, whoever the designer of record is. But um, it's going to be required for the installations to report up. So this is kind of a draft, and it'll, it's open for comment. And uh, keep an eye out for this in the implementing guidance review coming up. 
Um, so some of you may be thinking, what if we can't meet ESA Section 438 and there are some technical infeasibility reasons that basically you have site constraints that you can't infiltrate runoff. If you're out west, you may have water rights um, issues where you're not allowed to infiltrate. You, your site soils may be karst and you're not able to inf infiltrate due to um, the risk of sinkholes. There are several reasons stated here. This is just a screenshot from the USC and it kind of uh, gives some reasons and it basically says you have to use your judgment and figure out to the maximum extent technically feasible uh, did we, can we meet ESA and if not we have to document it. And what the SCD policy memo update from December of 2013 this is the excerpt from that where it says exceptions to the policy, and this is for all sustainability, not just ESA, but it says it actually has to go up um, through the garrison commander up the chain of command to request an exemption. So that's just something to point out. I don't think this is actually happening yet, but um, because the documentation aspect is coming, this is going to be um, a big thing in the next year or two that every project has to really document, and if they can't meet ESA, go through the required process to request an exemption. In that draft reporting form, there is a technical infeasibility portion where it asks for a technical infeasibility report to be attached to the reporting form um, with any site constraints and all the documentation that shows you can't meet ESA. So this is basically the civil engineer, um, you know, this, is, this would be data from their design analysis that they're going to have to attach to show that no, they can't meet ESA or they couldn't meet ESA to the full requirement. So the, the, um, now we're going to get into the actual process of um, designing and f planning for ESA. This screenshot is from the UFC for Low Impact Development, but also the EPA Tech Guide. The DOD adopted this as the process for meeting ESA. Um, so we first have to establish um, what is the requirement, what is ESA asking us to do, and we know that we can either retain the runoff from the 95th percent storm or do a continuous simulation model, which is a little more intensive and I think our hydrologists at Erdic would be more um, concerned with that. But for a simple military construction project um, with a relatively small site, um, the UFC is recommending to just do option one, retain the runoff from the 95th percentile storm, and that's how you know you met ESA. So what calculation is involved, um, the USC and the Army Tech User Guide um, recommends the SCS runoff curve number method, which is basically taking the difference between the existing site and the proposed site. What is the difference in runoff? And that is a requirement that you have to retain on site in order to comply with ESA. So we're going to be looking at this very simple example. You have an existing site, it's just um, a meadow area, just grass, um, and we want to build a parking lot, and we're going to treat that runoff with, or manage that runoff on site with bioretention cells. So we're going to input our data into the Army lid planning tool, which here is just kind of a screenshot of what, what are the inputs and then what are the outputs. We're going to input the project site area, the 95th percentile rainfall, the hydrologic soil group, and then um, our land cover areas and then we're going to get out um, the planning tool is going to tell us what is our required ESA volume to comply. So before we show the planning tool, um, what is the 95th percentile storm? That is what the EPA tech guide initially came up with that if you retain the 95th percentile storm, you're basically keeping most of the runoff on your site and small um, very infrequent storms are not going to be included in that. Um, it's not ESA's intent to manage that remaining 5%. It's basically 95% of the time this rainfall depth is going to be um, the amount that the storm would, the amount that the storm event is that depth. So EPA wrote that in their guidance and then DOD also adopted that and put it in the UFC that the 95th percent could meet the design storm. So here's just an example. Um, obviously all over the country you have different um, rainfall depths, but this is from the EPA Tech Guide. They have 
a table with typical rain, 95th percentile rainfall depth. And the Army Tech User Guide also has instructions for how you can download the rainfall data from NOAA and come up with it on your own. But um, a lot of our bases can just use the number that's already calculated either in the Tech User Guide or the EPA Tech Guide. So when we talk about land use and land cover, and Sharon touched on this, the DOD's definition of pre-development is pre-project. So that means DOD interprets pre-development as whatever is out there now, the existing land cover of the site. And then post-development is what's being planned for the site. So we are able to account for redevelopment and have a smaller ESA requirement um, when you do have a redevelopment project. You're not going to have as big of a difference in the runoff volume from existing to proposed condition when you have a pre-development um, that's already, a uh, pre-project that's already developed. So these, these photos are just a pre-project um, example where you already have a parking lot and then you're adding more and you're putting in a building and the pre-project that you're getting to account for is what's out there now. So based on these land cover types, the SES runoff curve number method assigns a curve number to each land, land use. And you really don't have to have a hydrology background to understand this. It's basically the curve number is related to soil type and land cover. So you have, if you have woods and sandy soil, um, you're going to have very low runoff, where if you have pavement, um, you have a very high runoff amount. So the number is between 36 to 100. And the planning tool assigns a curve number automatically to whatever land cover type you input. So going back to our example, here is the pre-project site. We have two acres of meadow. Our post-project site is 1.5 acres of parking and then half an acre of lawn. And then here's the planning tool. The white boxes are input data. Um, so we're just going to scroll through and you'll see kind of um, an explanation of what each section is. At first you're just going to put in your project info. Then you have your project area in acres and your 95th percentile rainfall which is in inches. Um, so this example is 1.6 inches is the 95th percentile rainfall amount. You choose your soil type um, which basically there's a description but there's hydrologic soil groups A, B, C, and D and basically A is the most sandy, B is the most um, most clay. And you're going to enter your pre-project land cover in acres based on the land cover type. So for our example we have two acres of meadow that was input. Our post-project we have 1, or 0.5 acres of lawn and 1.5 acres of parking. And by inputting this the, the planning tool calculates about 6,000 cubic feet of runoff volume is the difference between the pre-project and the post-project. So that is our ESA requirement for this project. And this could be done in the planning phase with very little information. Um, you just have to have your basically existing and proposed land cover and most installations have at least some knowledge of what the soils are on the site when you're um, in the planning phase. So you could very easily calculate this during a planning charade. So next um, we need to choose our impact development BMPs that we're going to do to manage that runoff requirement. Um, so this is just the next step of the USD and EPA process. Um, what they have highlighted here is kind of the big four, we call it the bioretention, permal pavement, cisterns and recycling, and green roofs. But there are many other um, lid BMPs to choose from, but these are kind of the most common, so that's why they highlighted that. And there's just a list of more BMPs that could possibly be chosen from. But in our in the planning tool, the second page of the planning tool, you can actually choose your BMPs and enter um, estimated sizes in order to see how much runoff volume those BMPs manage. So structural BMPs such as bioretentions and permeable paving are accounted for by an infiltration volume. Um, and then non-structural BMPs such as reforestation are accounted for by changing the curve number in your post-project land use, which is basically going to decrease your runoff in post-project by accounting for the non-structural BMPs that way. So here's our example again. The 
we, we put in bioretention cells to treat that parking lot. And in the planning tool, we input 7,500 square feet of bioretention, and that infiltrated about 6,089 cubic feet of runoff in the soils below in one day. So this is just a summary of our example. Um, we were required to manage 5946 cubic feet of runoff, and then we complied by implementing 7,500 square feet of bioretention, <coughs> um, and that infiltrated 6,000 cubic feet of runoff into the soils in one day. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Sharon. So, Sharon again. So that was a brief introduction to our our planning tool. And we are planning, this, is a, this webinar was basically an overview of the Lone Pack Development Initiative that uh, OAXM is leading. And we plan to have a webinar series in the future, in, sometime in FY15, where we will go into further detail on the planning tool for those of you that are interested. We will also have a webinar on the BMP toolbox so that you know, we highlighted a few structural BMPs and non-structural BMPs, but we'll go into a little bit more detail and add a few more BMPs to your toolbox. We will also go have a webinar on the cost planning tool that we, we have enough time today to demonstrate, but um, we can go into detail on that. And in the future, we'll also have a webinar on the implementing guidance once that the um, common period has been wrapped up and it is signed. We'll go over the details of that and what to watch out for. And we also will demonstrate a stormwater BMP database for installation. So it's a great tool that we've used for Fort Meade, Andrews Air Force Base, to keep track of their BMPs, their maintenance schedules, and all of that. Okay. So watch out for that in the future. It'll be on the sustainability series. Um, OAXM also has some initiatives going on for FY15. One thing I know many people are wondering about is how to plan for funding the maintenance of the BMPs that we're putting in the ground. So we will be looking at assigning CAT codes to the to BMPs so that way you can program for maintenance funding in the future. Another thing that we mentioned earlier in the webinar is developing a installation design guide supplement and that will help installations as they're up updating those documents to ensure that loan pack development is appropriately included. And in the future we plan to enhance the planning tool that you just saw as well as the cost tool that is drafted right now. Okay. And that brings us to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to thank you all again for coming online and, and uh, look Think what we have to say, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Okay, this is Eric Mucklow uh, stepping in as well. Uh, I've just opened up a text box on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, at the bottom of that column, you'll see a little uh, text entry point where you can type in your questions. The questions will show up in the column above only to me, and I will consolidate and um, and read out loud the questions for the sake of the recording and, and so that the uh, presenters can uh, answer them basically one at a time, uh, trying to control the flow there. Um, as people are formulating their questions, let me take a second to pop back over to the uh, introduction slide here. The um, AIA credits are available uh, for the architects out there. Uh, if you send your AIA number to the uh, SNE webinar email address at the bottom here, um, you can get uh, CEUs, uh, learning units, or rather, uh, in groups of five. Um, that equals uh, half a CEU. The uh, quizzes will be posted on the Mercy site. And uh, once you've done your five webinars, uh, you can take the quiz, send it in, and get credit. Uh, we had a couple uh, webinars that were missing their videos until recently. I've just uh, managed to find some. Uh, in the system that uh, we couldn't find before and got those uh, uploaded. So we, uh, we should have uh, most of them up there now. I think there might be one or two uh, that we need to add back in. Uh, so there's the text box if people want to uh, enter their questions. And um, 
I had one. As far as the uh, the planning tool and all that, uh, is that is that a current requirement, or will that be a future requirement? Or I think there might be some people concerned about the impact on the project manager's uh, workload. Hi, Eric, uh, and everyone out there. This is uh, Bill Sparallo, XM. Uh, what's what? What is the question? Uh, what does it concern? The pl you're talking about the planning tool. What do we have to use it, or is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. If, is that something that has to be filled out and submitted um, to you know as part of the project process? Um, that's an additional uh, effort on the part of the project managers uh, that they'll have to work into their schedule. Well, I think that you know, I think the planning tool is a very valuable tool to help the uh, the garrison, the DPW master planner, and the engineer really develop an understanding of what type of lid BMPs they might want to consider for their uh, for their pr uh, proposed uh, construction project. Uh, as far as you know, does somebody have to use the planning tool? I would say no. But at the planning charrette, you're going to want to. Uh, have a complete understanding of how much uh, stormwater runoff is needing to be managed on site, and uh, what better way to you know develop a uh, a way ahead on on how to manage that than to use the planning tool. It have you know it, you can sit and play with the tool and throw different options at it, and you know relatively easily so that a person could. Uh, Understand how many square feet of a BMP is needed, or how many gallons uh, uh, the cistern, you know, would be required to, uh, you know, to manage uh, the water that's uh, that's running off from the site of that 95th percentile storm event. So I would highly recommend you you become familiar with it and use it, uh, but you don't have to use it. Okay, uh, I'm going to consolidate a couple of questions here that seem uh, along the same lines. The uh, from uh, Stephen and uh, Stephen and Lydia Linda, sorry, at uh, Fort Bragg. Um, so basically, the uh, defining definition of the facility in relation to expand the footprint of existing facilities by more than five thousand gross square feet. Um, is that the buildings, or is that also including uh, horizontal construction? Like if you're expanding a parking lot, but not a building. Uh, would the lid requirements of ESA apply? Uh, yeah, we're using the word footprint interchangeably with like limit of disturbance. So basically, if your site area is 5,000 square feet or greater, then ESA section 438 applies. So the uh, the site area that that uh, if you are expanding a, par a parking lot. Uh, or, or doing something that would uh, result in imperviable uh, pavement or some other ground cover over 5,000 square feet, whether or not it's a building or something, um, then it would then it would apply. Yes, definitely. Um, it does, and I see Linda's question about horizontal construction. It definitely applies to horizontal construction. It's just is it the site area greater than 5,000 square feet? That's the threshold. Okay. I don't know. Uh, are you familiar that much with uh, Maryland stormwater requirements? Somebody asks if Maryland stormwater requirements uh, would make you compliant with ESA 438. Um, this, this is Aaron. I'm, a, I'm familiar with Maryland um, environmental site design, and it's actually you can't really compare them, but um, Maryland happens to be pretty strict as far as the rest of the country. So. There's a chance that if you're meeting Maryland, you're also meeting ESA, but it's a uh, retaining, ESA being a volume retaining requirement, meaning you have to infiltrate. Um, and a lot of bases in Maryland that have clay soils or high groundwater and they can't infiltrate, they can meet Maryland without meeting ESA. Um, but in at a base, they have very sandy soil. If you're meeting Maryland requirements, you're probably meeting ESA, but it's two separate calculations and there's different design storms, so the designer really has to look at all the requirements, ESA and the state and local requirements, and then design to the most stringent. Okay. Uh, now one thing, so if you're not able to fit uh, the mitigation into the project site boundary, are you able to use an alternative area, uh, alternative area on the installation as part of your quote-unquote site to comply with ESA? 
Yes, and that I believe is in the um, implementation process. They kind of have a disclaimer in here that says, so, um, if you can't design all the runoff volume on your site, you can start looking at off-site options and the, then the ideal case would be downstream of your site um, within the same drainage area can you treat, um, but if not, you, you can look elsewhere on the base, but I think that's the, that's kind of where the maximum extent technically feasible kicks in if you can't do it on your site and then you look elsewhere on the base, can you fulfill the ESA volume there and only when you've exhausted all those options um, would you start um, looking at the technical infeasibility constraints. Okay. Uh, now getting to the uh, best management practices, are the costs for LID best management practice BMPs that are detailed on the 1391, are they only the cost of the LID or are they the delta between conventional and LID? And if the LID is less than conventional uh, strategies, then nothing would be tabulated on the 1391. Yeah, this is Bill. Um, the the actual cost of the lid BMP should be uh, what's what's identified on the uh, thirteen ninety one on tab A. Okay. Now you know so a, not, not. a construction project might have you know ten or or twenty different BMPs, and each one of them should be you know itemized separately. Okay. Uh, so that's so it's the total cost of the lid BMPs each. And not uh, not the delta between uh, the traditional strategies. Correct. Okay. Uh, which BMPs have you found most uh, cost effective? Um, that definitely depends on your site, uh, but I think for the most part, bioretention has been the most widely adopted all over the country. You see them everywhere. Um, they're basically just look like landscaping features when they're finished, but because of what's involved in a bioretention, there's just soil media, gravel. These are all site kind of materials that are relatively uh, less expensive, whereas um, more like a rainwater harvesting system and things that have to do with the, uh, maybe reusing gray water within the building, those kinds of systems are obviously much more expensive. But from the surface site features, you see bioretention and permeable pavement seem to be the most popular and I'm sure cost has to do with that. Um, but it, I mean there's different variations of bioretention also. You see swales and things like that. Basically the landscaping type features we think are the least expensive. So, so a, a bioretention area with an underdrain, uh, would that meet the requirement of quote unquote retaining uh, the 95th percentile of the storm, storm on site? That's a good question. It depends if the underdrain is at the bottom of the gravel section or towards the top. If if your underdrain is at the bottom and you're really not allowing any infiltration, then you're technically not retaining the volume, which is what the EPA guide and the Army Tech User Guide um, have the basis of you know managing that ESA requirement. It means you have to retain it. So when you have an underdrain at the bottom of your section, that's more like detaining, which is just temporary storage, and then it's going out to the storm drain system. But in some cases, you can't infiltrate, and you have to have um, uh, an underdrain, and then that would be an example where you're not fully complying with ESA, but you're doing as much as you can to meet the intent. Um, but no, I don't think uh, retaining, if you have an underdrain at the bottom, it's not retaining. You'd have to have the underdrain towards the top of the gravel layer, and then you're allowing for some infiltration underneath that recharge uh, storage area. Okay. So an, an, an impermeable uh, something with an underdrain that just slowly dumps the water into the storm system is not retaining. But if you have a permeable something rather with a higher drain than uh, you know bioretention area, then uh, then that would that would work. Yeah, as long as your calculations can show you're infiltrating the the ESA requirement as far as how much has to infiltrate um, into the soils below, and that depends okay. on the soil infiltration rate. Okay. Now, um, Mark uh, asks, 
Why is the old term SCS being used is when it has been in RCS for quite some time in his circles anyway? Oh uh, yeah, sorry about that. The um, that's the uh, SCS runoff curve number method. That's just kind of we we use that interchangeably. Probably sh we shouldn't. It should be NRCS, but um, I believe that's the name of the agency changed. But when we say SCS curve number method, we just mean that the one that we all know, the TR55 uh, curve number. That's pretty simple for um, small site runoff calculation. Okay. Uh, until any, that's the last of the questions that have come in so far, and we are um, at two minutes to go to the hour, so we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, you all, uh, for coming, uh, Aaron and Sharon and uh, Bill, uh, for joining us today. I think uh, we covered a lot of stuff. It's certainly very informative and and um, and uh, detailed, and I think that. Uh, the tool uh, will be very useful to hopefully some of our participants, and uh, we will look uh, forward to looking at the, the documents that are coming out for review and, and as these things uh, progress. Uh, again, on the screen, I have the uh, email address and the Mercy website. Um, there's also links um, for uh, past webinars down on the uh, uh, web links box on the right of the screen as well as an uh, email us link. Uh, there's also in the file share area down there, there's the uh, a copy of the presentation. Uh, for those who want to download a copy of the slides, I'll leave, uh, leave the meeting room here open uh, after we close here uh, so that people can have an opportunity to download that if they would like. Uh, note that the under the web links, that link is to our new Mercy site. Uh, if you haven't been there, uh, make sure you can go and get in if you have to not sure if you have to recreate uh, your login ID. I believe it's on a different server than the prior Mercy site. So uh, hopefully people can get in there okay. So uh, thank you again for joining us. And uh, everyone have a nice day.